Yesterday, we kicked off the conference with an amazing program, with a lot of great speeches, and today, we're doing not less. We're just going to have such an amazing program as yesterday, different topics, of course, and it's going to be very exciting. I'm very happy to be with you here today, wherever you are, be it that you are in the room here at the Lux Expo in Luxembourg, or whether you are connected over the hybrid conference from somewhere in the world. Welcome to each and every one of you. It's great that you are here with us today. I'm Peter. Peter Pöhler is the CEO and, no, not the CEO. In this case, I'm not going to speak about my business. Let's say like this, I'm a digital entrepreneur, active since over 20 years in the domain. And I'm very happy and very proud and very humbled also being your host for these three days at the Connecting Tomorrow conference. We're going to pass and stay together for the next two days still. And it's a good moment also to, on one hand, reflect on what happened yesterday before we are going to kick up with the first speaker. And at the same time, also to go through a couple of housekeeping rules. It always sounds kind of horrible when I say housekeeping rules because it sounds like rules. You cannot do this, you have to do that, or no. No, 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 absolutely not. In this case, it's very nice. It's commodities. It's good things that I have to tell you. The first thing is we're having the conference in English, but we know very well that not everybody speaks English or prefers maybe another language, and that's why we have a live interpretation which is ready both in the room here, but as well also for those who are connected on the internet side. It's very simple. The only thing that you have to do, you have to click on the left side, there's a little icon on the internet side with the globe, and there you have uh, the access to the interpretation. You can choose your language, be it French, be it German, and voila, there you have your interpretation, and you can listen to the whole conference program in your preferred language. For corona reasons, well, you know, the pandemic is still active. We don't have any headsets now here in the Lux Expo in the room. That's why if you would require the interpretation as well, German or French, please take your smartphone, take your own headset, and connect as well to the website and choose your interpretation. It's really easy, it works. It's a very nice example of connecting, not only tomorrow, but connecting already today, things that were simply not possible some years ago. It's also a nice example behind the scenes. I remember the good old times kind of where at such conferences we had a couple of translator booths where the people were sitting in there and doing the translations. Today this has changed quite a lot. Today they are sitting somewhere across the world wherever they might feel comfortable to work from. They have their internet connection, they see the speaker program and they do their translation, their interpretation on the fly, which will be integrated into the live stream or stream back simply to the people who are on site. I think that's a great achievement, a lot more flexibility and so much more possibilities. Overall, we can say that the pandemic didn't have much good things, that's for sure. But one of the good things is clearly that the format of hybrid events became much more popular and will become even more popular now in the next foreseeable future. And that's, in my opinion, quite a good thing because it gives us a flexibility that we didn't have before. It breaks the boundaries of what has been possible before. Whenever had it been possible before to bring in so many speakers virtually from all across the globe without having to move them into the plane, to bring them over to the place, and how many speakers didn't come, how many attendees didn't come, simply because it was not feasible, possible, or maybe also even simply too expensive for them to travel over here to the place where the conference took place. That's something which works so much better with hybrid conferences. And some might say, yeah, but hybrid conferences, we are losing kind of the feeling, we're losing the possibility to network, to interact directly. Yes, that might be true, but on the other hand, we have also a remedy for that. There are a couple of things. On one hand, we have over here, we have in physical, in presence, we have a couple of booths of providers from Luxembourg, companies from Luxembourg, who are showing their 5G appliances. That's amazing, but you can find them also online. You can also get in touch with them directly online, which is a great thing. The second thing is also, if you have during the conference any questions to any of our speakers that you would like to be answered, 
No problem at all. We have a question section that you can find also on the event side. On the left side, again, there is a tab which is called questions. Just click on it, ask your questions, submit it. And the good thing is also, these questions can be upvoted. That means if you like a question which has been asked already, just click on it because then it will be upvoted and will be higher ranked and it's more likely that we're going to answer these questions. The other thing is also that if you're here in the room itself, then please don't expect us to run around the old-fashioned way with a microphone and to hand over the microphone so that you can ask your questions. Please use as well the event website just to ask your question, just as if you would be connected virtually. We're going to receive the questions. Everybody else can see the question as well. Vote for the question as well. Like this, we create kind of a global community of those who want to participate. Same applies, by the way, also for the networking. I know myself, and I will not contradict anyone, that the networking in person is unbeatable. But still, we have the possibility as well on the website of the conference to join the digital networking, to connect. You have filled out your profile, you have given your preferences, you have given your details. Other people who are open to network can see this information and they can get in touch with you and connect with you. And that's something which is great because it helps you not to be alone. Just use this opportunity to get in touch with other people from the conference to forge new connections and to pave maybe the way to the future. I know that quite a lot of you are either entrepreneurs or people who are very interested also in developing new things, in new technology. This is the right opportunity for you to get in touch with the people, to create these new bonds and to create tomorrow. Connecting tomorrow. That's what we do here. Not only with the topics on stage, but especially also with the human interactions that we're going to forge during the conference itself. I mentioned already that we had yesterday a day which was crammed full of very, very interesting topics. And I know that not everybody could have attended yesterday. And that's why, allow me to make a short recap about what happened yesterday before we're going to start the conference program of today. We had an opening of uh, the Prime Minister and Minister of Telecommunication, Xavi Böttel, who was speaking about not only the importance of being inside a global environment, being connected with the other European partners, discussing about all the different developments in the future, but also about the broadband strategy that they are applying here in Luxembourg, about the GIE which has been created, which is helping to connect everybody here in Luxembourg and to provide broad access to broadband here in Luxembourg and of course also beyond kind of uh, the borders of Luxembourg. He spoke about 5G, quantum, space, etc. Many different things that he involved in his speech. After that, we had John Justy, the chief regulatory officer from GSMA, who was speaking about GSMA's view on the importance of the UN SDGs and how the telco industry is contributing to these SDGs. And then after that, we had one of the highlights, clearly. Göran Marbi, the president and the CEO of the ICANN, of the top-level organization of the Internet, their insight on the connectivity on tomorrow, their role also especially supporting local communities and um, including newly connected ones. So their role was quite important also, contributing to the necessary performance when it comes to traffic, resilience, but also their underlying technical role. Very interesting as well from Paul Lee, the keynote, the head of tech, media and telecoms research from Deloitte UK. He was speaking about connectivity 2021. We are still barely connected. He was pointing out that, yes, people are connected, but we are still only at the beginning of being connected. I still remember how he was said yesterday, even those people who are connected, very often they are not necessarily really connected because they don't use the connectivity. Also, the divide between those who can afford a good connection and those who can't afford a connection. Very important also here. What is digital eruption? And based on connectivity enhancement, connectivity will become clearly an increasingly strategic point. And in return, the more connection you have, Paul pointed this out very well, the more connections you have, the more people who are connected, this will generate also new applications and services. 
if there is a demand and a possibility, then the industry, on the other hand, will react and will create the things. So Paul was pointing out that the foundations for future demand for 5G are being laid. Even if device ownership is reaching a plateau, usage per device can and will continue rising for the foreseeable future. Then we had case studies. It was quite amazing to discuss in a panel discussion with Christian Mikas from the European Commission, from Armin Greta, from BMW, and last but not least also from Dirk Hetzer from T-Systems International in Germany, speaking about transforming mobility. I mean, everybody knows today autonomous vehicles. Everybody knows that Google is working on it, Uber is working on it, Apple is working on it. Uh, there are so many other ones which are working on autonomous driving. But still, it's something which is, at the same time, so close and so far away. It was very interesting also to learn that there is a shift for the moment. For the moment, the companies are working still on equipping their cars with as many as possible sensors, radars, cameras, detectors, so that they can scan the environment just as we do and drive no matter where they are. On the other hand, the service providers are working also on providing an infrastructure on the roads itself where the cars, no matter what sensors they have, can just dock in and can drive autonomously from wherever they are without needing to have all these sensors. That's something which is very thrilling and where we are going to see in the next 10 to 15 years quite a lot of development. And my prediction is still that probably in 35, most of the people will be driven autonomously and will not drive anymore. My panelists were not so happy with this idea. So they believe that it might take a little bit longer, but let's see who will be right. So connecting tomorrow means also having appointment again here in 10, 15 years to see what happened over the last time. Also very interesting, the discussion that we had from Christoph Klenner about new services for travel and tourism. What can be done, not only under the light of the pandemic, but especially also in the future? How can travel become a better space through augmented reality, through virtual reality. What possibilities do you have with your smartphone in your pocket if you travel somewhere just to see eventually buildings which don't exist anymore, information about things, information about sites, and so much more, or maybe even completely virtual travels with your headset in the future? It was very exciting as well to hear from Christoph what he's playing with his company. And then health. Telemedicine. We had a panel with Zohar Singer from Israel and Dermot Doyle from Luxembourg. It was very interesting to hear their point about telemedicine. What is possible to connect doctors to remote rural areas, for example, to connect doctors with specialists who can further investigate? What is the possibility in Israel, for example, if someone in the middle of the night needs some doctor and there is no doctor really anywhere? This was quite exciting and also the possibility to see digital surgery being assisted by specialists from all across the world. Very interesting as well. And then we came almost to the end of this uh, day yesterday. Opportunities for future emergency services. How can 5G especially help emergency services do a better job in case of an emergency? And last but not least, connecting rural communities. It was quite interesting to see also what possibilities 5G brings to just fill these gaps on the map these white spots, all these elements which are not yet connected, where people don't have a good connection. That was quite interesting. So we had a day which was crammed full. And I promised you that this day will not be more boring. Absolutely not. It will be much more exciting even, I would say, because we have a lot of interesting topics. And without any further ado, I'm going to move over to my first speaker, it's the opening speech. How can telecom industry support the UN's sustainable development goals? And it's going to be delivered virtually. I said we're a hybrid conference, so also speakers are connected virtually by Bilal Jamusi, the Chief Study Groups Department, Telecommunication Standardization Bureau, ITU in Switzerland. Bilal, a very warm welcome for you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning to you and to our uh, colleagues uh, physically present in Luxembourg and online. Uh, very pleased to join you from uh, Geneva, Switzerland, the ITU headquarters. Um, a, a 
very good summary of, uh, of yesterday's discussion. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, fill in today on the um, work that the ITU is doing uh, in terms of uh, the connectivity. Uh, the um, ITU, in a nutshell, is the UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Um, we basically deliver the uh, coordination of spectrum uh, and standards uh, that enable the 5G and other generation of uh, connectivity. Today, 95% of the international traffic is carried over fiber optic networks built on ITU standards. 80% of the internet traffic is video, and most of it is using um, ITU standards to encode and decode the video uh, standards on the internet. Just to give you an example of the importance and reach of standards uh, to enable uh, the uh, connectivity and the sustainable development goals. Now to the connectivity. Um, it's good that more people are getting connected. However, we, we still have almost half the world population unconnected. This map shows um, in red the color of the uh, not connected people, uh, 270 million in Latin America, 700 million people in Africa, um, 1.4 billion uh, in, in Asia. So there's quite a bit of road ahead to connect the, the world population. If we look at the uh, connectivity today, almost half of it is 4G, a quarter is 3G, and believe it or not, a quarter of the world is still using 2G to connect. Over the next five years, we expect 5G to have about 20% of the connectivity with uh, a lot more 4G and less and less 2G, but it's going to take a while to really replace all of the 2G networks by data-enabled networks. Uh, remember that 2G networks don't provide data connectivity uh, the way that we want it. So um, 5G is a lot more than a radio interface. It is, uh, as we've heard in your summary, about ultra-broadband, low latency, and massive connectivity. And um, uh, the, the contribution and the work that in standards that is uh, innovative to enable 5G a lot of it has to do with the fiber optic infrastructure. A spectrum is sort of the lung of um, the, the oxygen for, uh, for 5G, and uh, fiber optic connectivity is the, it, are the lungs to, to carry that oxygen. From a, an environment and um, uh, electromagnetic fields, uh, the ITU delivers and publishes the standards that allow uh, regulators to measure the EMF, uh, we have done an update on these uh, standards based on the latest ICNRP and WHO uh, guidance with respect to 5G. Nothing new in this space. A lot of the spectrum used by 5G is already used by 4G. Uh, so from an EMF perspective, uh, there is no additional uh, uh, you know, challenges. Um, and the new spectrum used by 5G is at the higher frequency where it has less penetration to uh, human bodies. So, from an EMF perspective, uh, we, we should not have any worries. Uh, the, uh, now I would like to move on to the digital transformation and why this is critical for the sustainable development goals. Um, ITU traditionally was a telecom, it's the International Telecommunication Union. But over the last few years, we have seen a surge in membership from private sector operating in adjacent sectors or verticals, healthcare, automotive, transportation, um, utilities, uh, smart cities, because ICTs are becoming the enabler for that digital transformation. And there has to be a dialogue between um, both telecom regulators and the other sector regulators to enable it. From a statistical perspective, in, in terms of the expected use of 5G, uh, in addition to the smartphone connectivity, many industries are uh, counting on 5G, and as, as you mentioned, Peter, in your summary, automotive industry is one very good example. So let's take a look at this digital transformation enabled by international standards in four areas, financial inclusion, uh, automotive industry, smart cities, and digital health. In the um, financial inclusion, there is still about 1.5 billion adults that don't have a bank account. Out of those, uh, about 1 billion have a mobile phone. So obviously, um, 
uh, it's a target to have broader financial inclusion through mobile phones and telecommunication. And for that, the ITU, the World Bank, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have been on a journey of the financial inclusion global initiative over, over the past few years. And we had target countries in Mexico, China, and Egypt to implement uh, these uh, regulatory guidance, new standards on security and quality of service to make sure more people are banked, because that's one way to reduce the poverty by including men and women uh, working um, to be able to really be part of the economic system. We have been also working on uh, digital currencies, uh, because that's an, a new uh, era that would uh, be less, uh, more interoperable in terms of the various uh, mobile money uh, um, systems. The second area of digital transformation is for road safety. Um, all the cars sold today are connected. They have at least two SIM cards. And when you have a SIM card, you have a phone number attributed by the ITU. It's called E164 number. It's basically the, the encoding of a telephone number, but now it's being used for connecting the, automo the, the car, the vehicle. Um, and with that connectivity comes a lot of opportunities uh, for um, connecting the car with the manufacturer, for updating software, um, providing new maps, um, alerts to the road system. So you can say that the car is becoming the fourth screen after your TV, your laptop, and your smartphone. Your fourth screen is, is the car. Another aspect of connectivity in the automotive industry is uh, autonomous and assisted driving, uh, where you need a lot of interaction between the car and its environment. Um, and for that, we have a focus group working on basically benchmarking the AI driver compared to the UNECE um, uh, regulations on, on drivers, on safe driving. And uh, the last point, which we will be announcing just in a couple of hours today, is a new initiative on artificial intelligence for road safety uh, in partnership with the UN Special Envoy on Road Safety, Mr. Jean Todd, um, and the UN Special Envoy on Digital and Technology. Um, we believe that data for the driver, the car, um, the accident site, and the emergency response are data that are critical uh, to enable better road safety, especially in developing countries, where a lot of this data is missing today. The third area of the digital transformation, which will reach the uh, Sustainable Development Goal number 11, is smart, sustainable cities. We have a standard in the ITU called the Key Performance Indicators. Uh, this standard has been deployed in more than 100 cities worldwide. Uh, some nations have gone uh, nationwide with it, like Norway. Uh, all of the cities in Norway are implementing the ITU standard. And we have 16 UN agencies that joined the United for Smart Sustainable Cities to implement the ITU standard on the Key Performance Indicators. Again, it is data-based. There is 130 data points on uh, the smartness and sustainability of the city. And those data points are collected by the city, audited by the ITU independent auditor, and then a report is provided to the city to allow it to really build um, a master plan for uh, smartness and sustainability based on the real measurement of the state of the city. We do this in collaboration with ISO and IEC, our sister international standards organizations here in Geneva. And uh, we've been promoting this worldwide and we see that it's uh, finding a lot of traction to achieve the sustainable development num uh, goal number 11 of sustainable cities and communities. Digital health, you talked about it yesterday. Um, we cannot speak about uh, digital health without broadband connectivity to exchange those uh, radios, MRIs, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, we have standards that are being developed in collaboration with WHO, the World Health Organization, particularly this AI for Health focus group uh, that is looking at benchmarking AI algorithms being used to diagnose diseases. Um, and it is a joint venture, as I mentioned, with WHO. Um, now, uh, towards the end of my presentation, I would like to mention how we are doing this. Um, we have embarked on a journey called AI for Good. And we believe that AI is a way 
to accelerate reaching the sustainable development goals that are very ambitious, ambitious and they're just around the corner. Um, 2030 is tomorrow. So in order to reach all of those goals, we have a new tool in the toolbox. It's called AI for Good. We are uh, partnering with 36 UN partners to uh, do three things. One is to curate high-level webinars on how AI could be used for various sustainable development goals. Um, our service is always online uh, all year. Basically, every day we have a new webinar on one of the topics of using artificial intelligence for reaching one of the SDGs. As I mentioned earlier, today's webinar later on today will be on AI for road safety as one example. The other platform is the challenge. Uh, we believe that paper standards uh, used to be sufficient, but today, along with paper standards, we also need implementation, open source implementations. We are seeing that our industry members, uh, companies building products, rely heavily on open source. And for that, we have been doing challenges of problem statements, and we try to find the right solutions or the best solutions through these uh, competitions. Last year, we ran one on use, the use of 5G uh, machine learning, and we're doing a similar one uh, this year. Uh, now I'd like to uh, maybe conclude by uh, saying that the COVID-19 uh, has had an impact uh, on the work of ITU, mostly um, positive in the sense that we have been able to reach more people online. Uh, we had an increase, about 80% uh, increase in our participation, in the number of participants, 10% uh, in the increase of the number of countries participating in our standards development. Uh, the only bad news is that we had 5% decrease from least developed countries. And this shows the, still the fragility of connectivity, the cost of broadband, the lack of the resources powerful laptops, headsets, and so on, to be able to participate remotely in international negotiations and agreements on standards. Um, so with that, um, let me see, I think we are at the end of our presentation. I'd like to just uh, conclude by uh, inviting you all to the World Telecommunication Standardization Assembly, which will be in Geneva from the 1st to the 9th of March, where we'll be uh, chartering the uh, uh, course for the next four years for international standards at the ITU. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bilal. I hope you can stay still for a couple of minutes with us because uh, I might have a couple more questions on you. Are you still here or are you gone already? I'm here. You're there. Wonderful. You mentioned um, quite a lot also uh, AI for good. You mentioned those countries which are maybe not as advanced already in the connectivity as Europe, North America, for example, or part of Asia are. Uh, what kind of incentives can you provide to companies to cover exactly these markets which are maybe at first sight might not be as attractive? Do you have any thoughts about what to do, how, how to incite the industry to jump on these countries and to say, we're going to develop it? Absolutely. The, uh, these countries, in, uh, developing countries, are really looking forward to leapfrog, um, to go from 2G to 4 or 5G. Just in terms of connectivity, there is a tremendous opportunity to provide the fiber optic infrastructure, the wireless network. But on top of that, what's going to be critical is the digital platform, uh, digital identification, um, financial services, over mobile phones, um, doing projects on smart, sustainable cities, um, connecting hospitals, uh, providing remote uh, diagnosis through AI um, for health applications. Uh, there are so many possibilities, at least in those four directions I mentioned, automotive, health, cities, and financial inclusion, that would be at the top um, of mind for the policy makers and decision makers in these developing countries. Thank you very much for this answer. Uh, now, when I look here in the audience, we have a lot of younger people where I would say these are digital natives, uh, mostly millennials. Welcome to you also, and thanks that you have been here. 
uh, that you are here today. Uh, the question that I'm asking myself, when we look about connectivity, 5G, new applications, we very often, we target the younger people because they have a buying power, they have uh, the mindset uh, to connect, but we forget very often that a large part of the population, which by the way also partly very deep pockets, are older, 50 plus I would say. Uh, do you have some thoughts also about uh, how to integrate especially these people when it comes to smart cities, you mentioned it, or maybe also to other apply, applications, appliances? Absolutely. The uh, innovation comes through small and medium enterprises, uh, comes from startups. Um, once you have the connectivity, the rest of the digital platform is all software. And it relies on the youth with these programming capabilities and innovative ideas on how to use the smartphone or tablet to provide new applications. So for example, for smart cities, could be new applications on how you know, to connect the community, uh, to provide uh, better recycling services, uh, better parking uh, uh, solutions, uh, things like that, that are very basic, but they would require localized software in the local language, uh, taking into account the local culture, and uh, innovative youth in Luxembourg would connect with youth in these developing countries to create joint ventures. And all of this could be done online. In uh, IT, we opened a new uh, sector membership for small and medium enterprises at a very reduced uh, cost for membership just to allow for that uh, platform of interconnecting SMEs from developing countries with other SMEs from developing countries to do these uh, solutions together. Perfect. Thank you very much, Bilal, for your answers, for your explanations, for your thoughts. Very insightful, very helpful. A big and very warm applause, both virtually, but also physically, for Bilal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's dive into the next topic. We're going to go now more into the details, partly of what Bilal already, has already said. We're going to speak in a few about creating sustainable smart cities. Very interesting topic. Uh, but just to be broader, we're going to cover a couple more topics, of course, now in the morning. And we're going to speak simply about how connectivity can enable sustainability. Sustainability, I think, that's something which is important for each and every one of us today, not only because climate change, but overall, we have the awareness that sustainability is very important. What is maybe less known is how can connectivity really sustain this sustainability. That's something which is very important and where we are going to explore what possibilities we have. And therefore, for the first thing that we're going to dive into now is our panel discussion about creating a sustainable smart city. And as for a good hybrid conference, I'm going to be quite alone here on stage today, but I'm definitely not alone because I'm in very good company with Matt Clifton, the smart city program manager from Leicester City Council UK. You're virtually connected. Matt, thank you very much for joining in. Thank you very much for being here. Just as much as Teppo Rantanen, the executive director of the city of Tampere in Finland. Teppo, welcome and good to have you as well here. Finland is always or has always been quite a country which was quite advanced. My first cell phone was an Ericsson and I think without Finland probably connectivity would not be what it is today. I can say this very clearly. Maybe now they are not playing anymore this role in smartphone market, but at the end of the day, they are kind of very much advanced when it comes to connectivity. But now I'm not going to anticipate what you are saying. Matt, I would say I leave you now, make a short introduction about what you're doing, who you are, and what Leicester City also is doing when it comes to smart cities and sustainability. Thanks ever so much. Um, well, delighted to be here. My name is Matt Clifton, and uh, my role is Program Manager for Smart Cities in Leicester City Council, which is in the East Midlands uh, in England. Um, and what I would say is that for us, smart cities is all about people, inclusion, and creating a sustainable city made possible by the smart use of data and technology. To set the scene, we have exponential computing power at our fingertips, 
coupled with burgeoning network capacity or connectivity, and of course, widespread digital skills. And this is driving digitization in every aspect of life, making new ways of working possible and redefining place with the fusion of both physical and virtual worlds. Therefore, knowing what makes a smart city, we can focus on building the integrated capacity uh, to deliver joined up solutions. And those solutions will cut across the kind of boundaries, organizations that we find in cities in order to address economic, environmental, and social challenges. And those solutions, they may focus on skills, for example, in business and organizations, or they may focus on data, but also they'll focus on how in future we make better use of AI and uh, data science in order to automate decisions and, uh, and become more efficient and sustainable in the future. Thank you very much. Teppo, over to you. Thank you. So <clears throat> my name is Teppo Rantanen. I'm the executive director of the city of Tampere, uh, responsible for our smart city programs in addition to other things. But uh, to me, it has been the most in interesting journey the last five years when uh, we have been running our Smart Tampere program, a very uh, broad ecosystem program where we have uh, had the universities, uh, the research institutions, more than 400 companies working on a broad sense of smart city solutions. And one of the key uh, items has been from the start the connectivity of the city. So as you know, <clears throat> we being the Nokia country, we have always had a, quite an advantage on the connectivity. So for example, we had the first 5G network up and running for test purposes already three years ago. And we uh, brought that as a platform for companies to do and test uh, different things. But I think that the overall goals of the program uh, are changing towards what Matt just was saying. It's all about people. And it's uh, how we can make the connectivity and the data it is bringing uh, for the benefit of our people, for the uh, good life of everyday citizens. So we are actually now building a new program, which is called Data Driven City for Citizens which will be a continuation of our Smart Tampere program. And I'm excited to see where this leads because it's just all about connectivity, sensors, data, AI, and other topics we have been heard, hearing already today. Okay, thank you very much, Teppo. Um, maybe let's start with a more kind of a global question. Smart cities. Most people know already what smart home is, home automation. But smart city is maybe more kind of an abstract construct. Teppo, can you give us a couple of examples how such a smart city could look like? Well, we've been thinking about what would be a good way to describe it because we get that question quite often as well. And I think you can easily describe it by looking at some examples which uh, we have uh, been doing, for example, both from the test uh, purposes but also putting them in real life. Uh, one of them could be, you know, how do you teach kids in school? We are using now robots for teaching uh, mathematics and uh, language skills. And it's something which has had a phenomenal uh, impact on, on the kids' learning. The other one could be how you take care of the elderly people at their home, how you can help uh, the security and safety and, and monitoring of, of their situation. Uh, better. Or third one could be uh, looking into the uh, mobility, uh, how you make a mobility as a service concept uh, working. So I think these sort of things describe the smart city uh, uh, possibilities. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Matt, over to you. Um, the interesting question that I'm asking myself, and Teppo, you already mentioned it, kind of uh, people who are at home. How can a smart city, for example, help 
to promote social inclusion? What about marginalized communities, disabled people, to avoid the isolation of them? Because that's kind of a very human aspect as well, especially in times of pandemic, which hopefully will be over at some point. But how can the smart city jump in here? Well, I think one of the key things is that we have equity in being able to access the internet, whether it's through devices being available uh, to everybody, whether it's affordable connectivity with uh, internet service providers, um, or whether it's just making sure that everyone has the skills that they need to be able to get on in a smart city, be able to find the jobs that have sustainability and, you know, uh, good incomes and the like. So, you know, digital is really key for that. What I would say is that um, clearly from a, a infrastructure perspective, connectivity is key. Um, it is the critical infrastructure of a smart city. And then on top of that, um, we need to think about how we support the future digital economy and employment opportunities, looking at the way we work with businesses to promote that, and how we use tools like virtual reality, particularly in terms of breaking down isolation and supporting people who are perhaps homebound, particularly in an aging society. Teppo, over to you also, just kind of liaising on, on what Matt just has said. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's, it's quite striking that Nordic countries, especially Finland, really, they are always quite in advance before it was with telecommunications, now it's with connectivity, Nokia, etc. I mean, everybody knows that Finland, especially, is quite advanced. Um, why is that so? Why are you more advanced? Uh, I mean, Finland is a very big country, partly very sparsely populated. Could that be maybe one of the reasons why connectivity is so much more important for you eventually than maybe for countries which are differently structured? Or are there other reasons? I think that uh, one thing that Finland has been said, and I think it's probably true, we are a country of engineers. So there's a lot of engineers, a lot of interest in the in technology, uh, in, in making you know things happen. And, and people are eager to use new technology, and people are willing to uh, you know open up their data, for example, for, for use. Part of that being that there's a huge trust in society uh, in, in the country. So people trust government. People trust the way that the data is being treated. And that makes it easier to use the data. But of course, yes, uh, the distances mean that we also have to be smart how we do things uh, when, when people are, when we are remote. But I think that uh, the other thing is that we have been looking at how we can make it easy to use technology. So what Matt was saying about uh, that you need to think about the user experience for those who cannot use technology, who, who are, you know, difficult to use technology. And we're trying to see how we can make that help, uh, how can we can the user experience being easier for elderly people, and, and what sort of impact can we have on, on people on their, on their everyday lives. And I think that the general acceptance of using technology is the help in, in Finland it also helps us to bring these things forward. We have yesterday, we have made the interesting experience also with one of the speakers that we had also from Finland, that just as you pointed out also, it seems that the acceptance to give data to the government or to institutions seems to be in Nordic countries higher the acceptance rather than in more, I would say, southern countries. Um, Matt, over to you simply, what about the data points? Uh, how can you make sure that GDPR is, for example, followed? I know that especially, for example, in Germany, neighbor country of Luxembourg, uh, data protection is a very, very important topic. And as soon as new innovation is coming, for sure, someone will get up and will say, my data has to be safe. How can we make sure that with smart cities, the data, the enormous amounts of data that you're collecting are safe? first of all, and also how can you follow GDPR? It's an enormous task, I suppose. Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I think there are a couple of approaches we need to have. One is that GDPR is legislation, and city authorities are bound to follow the legislation and the regulations and the rules, 
and that is actually what we do. So there are things like um, data privacy impact assessments on all new kind of policies and activities to check that we are following the GDPR rules. I also think that whilst there is a, an important responsibility for public authorities to lead the way, Obviously, it's not all about cities and local government or national government. It's also the private sector have to respect the rules around GDPR too. Um, but I would say as well, of course, over time, there is increasing public acceptance that data needs to be used and shared. But I'll just end with the point that when we deal with data, particularly in the context of smart cities, it's not all about personal data, it's about city data. It could be environmental conditions, it may be kind of average speeds on roads and things like that, which actually are safe data to use and to share. And given that's the case, we need to try and think about how we can put useful, non-personal data into the public realm so others can make use of it as well. If I can just jump into that. Absolutely, Tepo, feel free. The, the, there's this really interesting aspect of how you can combine the private and public data. And, and with that combination, you can create something much, much more valuable for the individuals and for the communities, for, for the organization of services. And that is what we are trying to do now. And that is not easy because of all the GDPR regulations, what people are thinking about use of the data. But if we can be successful there, then we have a huge opportunity to provide better services for our citizens. You mentioned before robotic teachers. We just had a question coming in from the audience, and thanks, by the way, also for submitting questions. Just feel free to ask your questions over the app, uh, over the web app that we have for the event. So the question was about robotic teachers. Can robots, robots replace human teachers as it doesn't only require knowledge to teach? How you, can you tackle such a problem also? Well, the ex uh, example that we have is that they are helping teachers. So when you normally don't have you know, enough teaching capacity per, per class, uh, but with the addition of these robotic teachers, there has been a huge uh, improvement of how the teachers can actually use their best skills with the teaching skills are combined with these robotic teachers who by the way are, are very well received by the by the by the kids they are just fascinated about the you know, being taught by by the robots i can imagine i mean something like uh, like robotic teacher even my daughter she's seven years old she 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 tells me almost every second day that she wants in the future she wants to build robots to help in the household to make our life easier to help us <laughs> teaching and here and there so she's really a digital native and <laughs> quite fascinating and totally supported also um which is if already we're speaking about um now uh kind of schools respectively also uh, learning. I see that there is a certain divide also, a gap between those who can afford new technology, who can afford a high connectivity, a good connectivity, versus those who cannot afford it. Smartphones are something which is expensive, subscriptions, etc. How is it with smart cities? How can you make sure that smart city and access to all this remains affordable for everyone? I don't know who wants to answer, so it's actually a question to both of you, so, Matt. Okay, I'll, I'll just kick off with a few thoughts. Um, firstly, obviously, the pandemic was a, a great kind of push behind shifting learning and teaching online onto digital channels. So I don't know so much about teaching robots, but certainly the uptake in learning online, both for adults and obviously for younger people as well, um, how heralded a big change. Um, and I think our initial findings were that um, around 30% of households coped very well with that change. Another 30% had some problems, but by and large, okay. But there were a kind of 30% of households that struggled certainly in the first instance, to make that sudden switch from um, in-person learning um, to learning through online channels. 
But that really does underline the importance of making sure that people have the access to the devices, have the access to the connectivity, uh, and are able to get the skills. And some of the things we've been doing is lending devices through libraries to uh, families that might need them, but also we've been working with internet service providers to be able to access our social housing estates as well to ensure that uh, people have the choice of good provision uh, for internet services at an affordable rate. Temple, maybe a question for you also. Oh, sorry, jump in. Yeah, if I, if I jump in there. The, the, the good thing with Finland is that uh, because of uh, the history of using data, using mobile data especially, has led to that we are probably one of the cheapest uh, countries for mobile data. So for you know 20 euros, you can get an unlimited access to 4G uh, uh, fast connections, which means that the, the connectivity is such is not an issue. And then we provide for all the kids under 18 years old that they can have the devices they need for teaching. Uh, and also elderly people, we are bringing them the devices they need uh, at their homes if they are unable to uh, provide it themselves. So I think that the uh, that, that is something which, thanks to our high taxes, we can we can be uh, bringing to the to the people. But it's important to get this. Bilal, before in his speech, he was pointing out also the ITU standards for smart cities. Uh, in what way, for example, on one hand, Leicester, but also Tampere are complying, for example, with these standards, and combined with the second question also, how can you make sure really also that there is um, not only the data protection, but also the protection of the connection itself? People are connecting, people are doing partly very personal things, like, like uh, personal data that they are transmitting over these uh, things, without knowing sometimes even. How can we make sure that on one hand the ITU standards are respected, and on the other hand also the security and safety of the personal data is also assured? Maybe, uh, Matt, let's start with you. Well, I think in terms of standards, across local government in the UK, there isn't a joined up approach. Although I think slowly, local authorities such as Leicester working with others um, through groups like the UK Smart Cities Group, we're starting to identify how established standards, whether it's through ITU or through ISO, can apply locally. A lot of them, of course, do relate to, uh, relate to sustainable development goals. And I think the sustainable development goals are a very good yardstick for cities to use. So we do look at the targets under the SDGs, whether it's around climate action, whether it's around sustainable economic growth or infrastructure or partnership working and poverty reduction. We identify those as being relevant to our city. And I suppose there's no kind of one rule that fits all cities, but cities ought to look at those targets and see what's kind of the most pertinent to their situation. And that's what we do. Perfect. Teppo, over to you. I think that uh, this uh, following the standards, of course, something we do. Uh, SDG, we are using a yardstick for many cases. But the data security, the connectivity security, safety is something which is regulated quite quite heavily. But we also work closely with uh, with the companies uh, on the new technologies. One of them being uh, looking at the 5G, looking at the edge technologies, connecting to the cloud. How we can make sure that the data is being safe? How do we respect the my data principle? And that is something which we are in the core and, and, and try to be maybe in, even in, in ahead of uh, the, the group to, to, see, to say how we can uh, apply. Perfect. Thank you very much. Another question or another topic that I would like to address, if we speak about sustainability, of course, we speak also about green economy. We speak about um, protection of the environment. How can a smart city contribute to make a city greener, ecologically more viable, more sustainable? Teppo, maybe you can start on this question. Well, I think that's a general goal that we have. Tampere uh, set the goal to become carbon neutral by 2030. And we are on track, but it's difficult. Uh, and we have to be looking at all aspects of, of the city and what they do. 
And we need not only the carbon neutrality, but also uh, the broader biodiversity as, as one of those key, key things there. And we have also seen the close link of uh, linking the digital technology and more sustainable city, because we can avoid a lot of unnecessary uh, things we do traveling around and how we uh, uh, organize the city uh, with the digital technology and help the sustainability become true. Matt, what about Leicester? Oh, well, there's a, a very, there's a, a smorgasbord <laughs> of, uh, of things that smart cities ought to be doing on the environment. I would just simply say to begin with that if it ain't sustainable, it ain't smart. So, you know, sustainability, uh, particularly environmental space, sustainability, working towards net zero should be at the core of everything that we do. And this is why Leicester has declared a climate emergency and has made net zero a, a key kind of ambition for ourselves. But as I would say what's really important that in old, um, dense city areas, you do need deep retrofit. And that's an absolute urgency. I think to get to um, net zero by 2050, across the country, we have to retrofit one building every minute. So the task is very, very great. Um, so, but also, of course, we need sensors and meters, smart meters, to be able to tell us what's actually going on in terms of the performance of buildings in order that we can reduce the kind of the carbon. And we need to look at more local renewables, whether it's heat pumps or solar panels, and, and where we can draw upon that too. And of course, the data insights are really important. Having the platforms to bring together the data from the sensors, from the built environment environment in order that we can understand what's going on. A couple of things I will mention as well. We are experiencing the shift to electric vehicles, and I'm really very hopeful that will have a really important impact, and cities need to be able to help accommodate that change. But I also say it's not all about the highest tech. Some of the smartest kind of technology we can use is green technology, planting more trees, for example, green roofs, and we need to explore those wherever possible. Does it make sense to have, for example, green roofs, etc., connected kind of to monitor how healthy they are, if they need water, more water, or whatever, simply? Are there possibilities to do this? Just maybe the fun question in this case, but it's, it's a serious background, of course, also. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, the key thing about smart cities is instrumenting our in infrastructure to understand what's happening. So, yes, definitely sensors on green roofs, too. Perfect. Ooh. Matt, Teppo, thank you very much for your participation. It was very interesting, very enlightening also. I must say I learned quite a lot of new things. And I'm looking forward to a more greener world and to definitely also more smarter cities. I believe that our world is going to change quite a lot over the next years and it's going to become very fast. But also one thing is, which is for me very clear, it's not going to be the change that we're going to see very visibly, but there are a lot of changes which are in the background, which are going to take place without that we even see it. And connectivity, 5G, of course, plays here a major role. This said, a very warm applause and a big thank you, Matt, Teppo. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to make my job a little bit easier. I'm going to remain seated now to introduce my next speaker. And we're speaking here about 5G test beds and their impact. Now I'm not sure if you know what test beds in this case are. You might have an idea what a test bed is, 5G test bed, but no, I'm not going to anticipate what uh, Marco Niemi, Senior Business Advisor Connectivity, business from, you can guess it, Tampere, from Finland, is going to tell us. He's also connected virtually. Marco, great that you're here. The floor is yours. Big applause for Marco, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good to be here. Uh, we have we seem to have a, a strong rep representation from Tampere today. So I'm actually working in Depo's team, and uh, I think uh, we feel honored and humble by the invitation. So 
I'm uh, here to talk a little bit about what we are doing in the 5G area and um, uh, test beds. Uh, Depo already somehow highlighted uh, some of the things that we are doing, so I'm, I'm maybe giving a little bit more uh, details. Uh, No, I don't, I don't see my slides. It's maybe, can you maybe help me? Okay. Okay, thank you. So as, as Teppo said, we already started building this kind of towards 5G test network uh, 2017 in some suburb of, of Tampere uh, together with Nokia. What we did was that we uh, bolted uh, base stations to uh, to uh, street lamp posts, uh, built fiber to all of the base stations, and, and then we also added um, its uh, server close by. So what you can do with this network is that uh, you can get up to a millisecond, couple of millisecond level delays. And uh, that is obviously something that you need when you go to uh, uh, remote controlled machines or autonomous vehicles that talk to talk with each other and, and that sort of scenario. So what we wanted to do is, is to, uh, you know, help the local companies to, you know, test uh, their devices on on this uh, uh, living lab type of environment. Uh, I should mention Tampere has many small and also big companies working on remote controlled machines. Kalmar, for example, has a big R&D site in Tampere working on harbor equipment. Sandvik, similarly, on mining equipment. Bons working on forestry machines. So those are big uh, stock listed companies. But then uh, due to a big Nokia restructuring, we also have a very uh, a lively startup, uh, small company ecosystem working on digitalization on, on uh, these areas. So building sensors and software for these, these devices. So there, there was uh, you know, clear, clear need from these companies and the city wanted to provide some resource, resources to help this. So this is the kind of, kind of background. So the idea is to provide uh, this kind of living lab test, test facilities for the companies, of course, for the universities and research institutions. So Technical Research Center for Finland, VTT, is, is very active on uh, autonomous vehicles for, for 10 years or even more already. So that they, they have been one of the main partners here. Uh, but of course, we are not focusing on local, local things only. There is international aspect as, as well. And, and what we think and what we have already learned is that this kind of uh, testing facility is also very interesting for, for international cooperation, for international companies. And then, uh, this area that we have is already in several horizon projects, for example, as a living lab, lab test facility. Uh, then thirdly, of course, the city of Tampere is also interested in uh, in getting more knowledge on what, what does it take to make city suitable for autonomous, autonomous traffic, autonomous vehicles, how the traffic systems need to change, what digital uh, uh, facilities need to be built, how the cooperation with the public sector and private, private sector works. So this is, uh, I think, a smart city operations in practice in, in this area. Uh, one of the things uh, 
that is kind of also giving a practical anchor to the city activities is that Tampere has invested in a new tram line. And the strategy is that some of the tram feeder traffic would be done with autonomous vehicles. And on this test area that I showed earlier is one of the first areas to, where, where this will be tested. Actually, some of the tests will be starting next year already. And of course, also from the city perspective, it's important to uh, get feedback and maybe increase the knowledge, awareness and acceptance among normal citizens. And this kind of living lab facilities we feel work well for those targets. So we have a small project that has been divided into four, four key areas. So first of all, we have done a requirements a study. We, we actually took a pretty uh, pretty deep study on different living labs throughout Europe and also take, took a look on some of the areas in Asia and in the US and tried to collect some of the relevant uh, learnings uh, from those to our case. And then we have been working on technical requirements, legal aspects, uh, some of the infrastructure requirements, so we are actually upgrading some of the infra there to su better support this kind of autonomous vehicles. I will show some examples of that a little bit later. And then, of course, the uh, ICT things need to be up to date as well. Then the second big target is to uh, you know, create a sustainable operational model for the for the area. So, so far it has been built based on uh, temporary project funding, but the idea would be to create a sustainable operational model based on, for example, uh, membership fees from the companies. And uh, that could be then enhanced with some of the project funding, but there needs to be, we feel, uh, a sustainable uh, long-term funding for the for the living lab, lab to you know develop further, and this kind of membership fee model also gives you the anchor because in order for in order for the companies to be willing to pay pay fees, they need to get some value add from the from the area. So it kind of um, raises the bar also for for all the all the players in the area. And then, of course, uh, uh, marketing productization aspects are important. So when somebody wants to come to test, there needs to be you know, just practical facilities where to put, put devices, how to apply for licenses, and uh, that sort of practical things. So th those needs to be productized. Uh, this is some of the uh, test areas throughout the world that we uh, took a look on. Uh, I will not go through them uh, in this presentation. This just to give you an idea that there is a wide variety of uh, of test areas uh, in Europe and also abroad. Some of them operate on very big budgets and. Uh, some of them are actually many of them are quite closed. So the difference that we are looking at is that we are building an open area. So it's basically open for anybody to to come and test, and that uh, gives, uh, of course, a different flavor to some of the things that we we do. And of course, it's uh, also quite challenging, but uh, we are really looking after this kind of private sector, uh, public sector cooperation here. Uh, one of the things that we learned 
while doing this um, scan of the different areas was that um, and typically you have a closed area together with an open area and and of course as i said our area is, is open area so we have been thinking how to you know help some early testing and uh, we have uh, some of the companies in our area have their own small closed areas so so, so the thinking is that uh, we would uh, somehow uh, give access to those areas to third parties also so it also uh, kind of tries to work to, uh, towards this kind of real living lab uh, a cooperation mode of operation. The business case I talked about already, so the current thinking is somehow based on membership fees with some uh, government support and, and then project funding. Uh, when we are talking about this kind of open area, the open uh, aspect goes to sharing the data as, as well. And one of the challenges currently is that um, there are some standards, but they are quite much in development phase. So there, there is no ready, ready made standards that you, you could take and, and uh, apply to. So this is also, I think, has been an interesting learning experience for, for us, but also I think it's something that is uh, an interesting research topic. And then this is something that we have been proposing some of the uh, horizon applications, for example, lately. So in order to support this kind of uh, real third party, mode of operation in this area you need you need to work on these standards okay i will maybe skip this i i think i went through this quite a bit so of course economical things operational things technical things all those need need to you know be in shape in, in order for, for the area to, to be successful. A lot of actually practical things that you need to work on. Uh, this is an example of what, what we have been doing. This is a real unity view of the area. The green light the lines there show the uh, midpoint of the lanes and of course as such nothing very radical here but what is interesting is that this is all based on open data from city of Tampere uh, data sources that the company that has been doing this for us VTT has been uh, collecting from the open interfaces and, and then they have uh, massaged the data uh, and, and put that to this kind of unity in 3D environment. And it's actually in the, in the model you can drive with the vehicle uh, in, in a 3D uh, virtual env environment. So this is kind of a first step towards this kind of digital twin type of in, in environment. Um, the, this kind of collection of the data sets, so what they have, have here is uh, traffic lights, street signs, of course the dimensions of the street in three dimensions, uh, lamp posts, all that. Is, is then put into a package that a company doing tests with their autonomous vehicles could take and then they could do first tests with their algorithms or whatever at home in a virtual environment. And then when, when they feel comf comfortable with their you know, software, they can come to the living lab 
and it is uh, very close to, to the virtual environment. So this is kind of the target. But uh, as I said, there, there is a lot of uh, interesting practical engineering that needs to still happen in, in order for us to be there. This is another view of the same digital twin in 3D, and this now shows the you know, 5G uh, coverage uh, in, in colors here. So just, just to illustrate uh, the same idea with different data in 3D. So, Sorry, Marco, that I have to cut you a little bit short. It's extremely interesting. I hate doing it, but could you wrap up maybe in a few? Yeah, this is actually my sli last slide. So uh, I, I stop here. If, if you are interested, I have the contact information in, in my slides. So, so we are very interested in, in feedback and, and answering any questions you might have. Perfect. Thank you very much. I propose, as we are running a little bit short of the time, um, the contact details are here. Feel free also to contact Marco directly uh, if there are any questions. I found it very interesting, especially also to give the perspective of what is possible to create as test beds. Our Prime Minister Xavier Buttel yesterday, he also described as plan of the initiative of government to make Luxembourg itself also as a test hub, as a test bed also for new technology, which I find very interesting. A lot of things we are not going to see directly, but probably a lot of things we are going to see also in our daily life where we can actively contribute. Now let's switch over to a different topic, and I'm going to have a very interesting panel discussion now also um, about the take on Industry 4.0. Industry is something which we are all concerned, we all know that industry is required to produce, to manufacture the things that we're using on a day-to-day -day life. But at the same time, it's something which is also a little bit hidden in kind of a black box where we don't see necessarily what is going on behind the scenes. And that's why it's very interesting also to discuss today with experts about really the take on industry 4.0. How can connectivity increase productivity the industry itself. And for this, I'm very happy to have with me very qualified speakers with me. First, connected virtually from Spain, Kyriakos Exadactylos, the head of network architecture specifications from Vodafone Group. Uh, you're in Spain. Kyriakos, welcome. Great that you're here with us. Then on the other hand, I have Dr. Alain Schumacher, chief technology officer from IEE in Luxembourg, and also David Preuss, chief information officer from Köln Bonn Airport in Germany. A very warm applause to Kyriakos, Alain, and David. Good morning. I would propose, Kyriakos, start a little bit, tell us a little bit more about your work, what you're doing, what Vodafone is doing, and especially, of course, with a focus on industry 4.0 and connectivity. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks for the uh, honor to, to be here uh, and take part in this very, very interesting and exciting new area, uh, which is how, how uh, 5G and mobile networks can help uh, business enterprises and manufacturing and industry 4.0 uh, to be far more productive and efficient uh, and also enable new applications. Um, so in Vodafone, this is a, a new exciting area I has started more than a year ago. Uh, as you know, 5G is at the heart now of our Tech uh, 2025 uh, strategy in uh, in Vodafone. And um, the key the key uh, characteristics is that um, uh, up to now connectivity uh, in factories uh, and industrial applications uh, mainly have um, be using um, Wi-Fi or LAN connectivity. Um, and have run some limitations as to scalability, reliability, and control, which are very, very key when it comes to productivity and efficiency. So we need to take um, the best of the 5G uh, in order to provide um, high reliability, high speed, uh, and efficient convergent networks. And that is not 
only for the connectivity part. We need to build on top uh, added value solutions uh, and this is where it comes to building um, a platform um, that can sit on top of our 5G network and uh, uh, provide all the right uh, tools and uh, new applications. Even the customer can develop on top uh, to add uh, additional value on top of the reliability. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Kyriakos. Alain, IEE from Luxembourg. A little bit more information, please. You need to take the microphone, which is just lying next to you. Work something. Okay. It's switched on already. It's switched on. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having IE here today, in my person in this case. Um, IE stands for International Electronics and Engineering. We are a Luxembourgish based company and uh, started up uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, what are we doing? So, we are mostly in the business of automotive. Um, for seat occupation, uh, driver assistance system, and so on. And maybe a lot of you sometimes get some annoying signal when they don't fasten the seat belt. <laughs> so in 70% of the cars, it's we. So you will hate us if you put your heavy back on the passenger seat. <laughs> but it's very important not to put it there and to fasten the seat belt if you drive. Um, so IE is a company which is uh, dedicated to innovation, and we are uh, doing lab to fab, so it means all the sensor technologies we develop, we develop in-house, including electronics, software, and so on. And we, at the same time, do all related developments and manufacturing all our products. So that means uh, we always push for innovation, and uh, I think the reason why I'm here today is 5G is not something you can look away if something is busy about it. It really belongs uh, to the future, and uh, we also, as an innovative company, we have to think about how we can use this technology better in future for our products and functionalities. And I think uh, we will go a little bit more in detail later on. Uh, but if you allow, Peter, just one sentence. Uh, I heard that and I see that there are quite a lot of uh, A-level students today here. And I really appreciate uh, by your director or by the Ministry uh, of Education that you enable people to come here because what we all discuss here and over the next these three days is something which needs people which get the competencies, get the patient to support it. Because everything which you use each day is just possible if there are people willing also to go in that direction and to support. So I highly appreciate your interest to be here today. Take your time for this day and okay. So thank you very much, Alain. David, what about the Köln Bonn Airport? Good morning, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be here in person. I, I love it, I just fled the cage. Um, Cologne Bonn Airport is uh, a, a major um, freight hub. So we integrate upstream and downstream many stakeholders and uh, we see 5G as one of the future enablers that, that help us to explore new business cases, um, develop something together with the, with the stakeholders on our campus. And um, that especially goes hand in hand with IoT, with next generation um, industry. Yeah, partly we are also an in industry yeah, as an airport. Um, so um, deploying one of the largest 5G private networks for us is a, is a very strategic and important uh, invest that we are doing. Let's dive maybe also, I want, just want to stay with you for a second, uh, an airport itself. An airport itself is such a complex entity. Uh, it's like a small city where so many different actions take place every single second. At the same time, um, it's very, really focused on safety, on security. Connecting all this on quite a big landscape. I mean, if you look at the satellite images of an airport, that's huge at the end of the day. In the past, I suppose, you used Wi-Fi, you used maybe proprietary technologies. Can you detail a little bit more how 5G, as you said that you're operating uh, your private 5G network, how can 5G in practicality, how can it help to operate such an airport? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, very interesting question because the, there we are at the heart of, of the question of sustainability, right? Mm. If you want to cover a 10 square kilometers big, patch of land with many different and, and weirdly shaped hangars and, and, and facilities, 
you, you, have to, you have to pick your battle, right? So either I say, okay, I'll stick here with LTE, 4G, and here I stick with Wi-Fi, but it's, it is a hard task, and 5G helps us to really give coverage to each and every single piece, and that means also sustainability. If you want to cover a, a broad area where we need the coverage with Wi-Fi, for example, I have to deploy maybe 300, 350, 400 access points, right? And this gives me now a new opportunity to, to just cover the whole area with high throughput, low latency, high precision of, um, for example, geofencing and stuff like that that is possible with triangulation uh, within two antennas, right? It's a complete different story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kiriakos, maybe a question to you as well. Uh, you are more, on, of course, on the, on the Vodafone side. That means you're providing the architecture for industries like an airport, like other companies. Where do you see the challenges, but also the opportunities to do so, to equip such an environment? Yes, absolutely. And I mentioned before uh, some of the elements that uh, I mentioned here, high reliability and low latency are very, very critical when it comes to manufacturing processes and uh, being, uh, being more efficient. Um, the speed and, 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 and high throughput um, as well become important when you start scaling. Yeah? So what we are seeing now from the first customers that uh, we are blinking in is initially private network uh, goes on the first site. Uh, the experiment with the technology of the 5G is a different um, um, also, also technology compared to the previous ones. But um, after that, they, they want to expand the technology to many more locations and factories, not only nationally, but also international. Yeah? And then we need to have flexible architectures to be able not to go and deploy separate networks in all these locations, but utilize our assets we have from from the 5G national network and also international, we have central uh, IoT network in, in Vodafone uh, where we now leverage for uh, providing service to, to mobile private networks. So uh, leveraging our current network assets and spectrum assets um, is, is very, very important to be able also to offer to customers not only the service uh, with the right uh, quality, but also at the right cost. It's an interesting point that I would like to liaise also with Alain on here. Um, Kiriakos pointed out actually that you can use 5G to connect different remote locations. Now you're as a producer from the industry, you're in the situation that on one hand you're using connectivity with the products that you're selling to car manufacturers for example, but on the other hand how can you use also itself connectivity to improve and to streamline and to optimize your processes in the production itself? Yes, I think uh, that is a very good point. So as an automotive supplier, we are forced to be cost efficient as much as possible. And um, as much as possible, and that means also that you have really to find out how you can uh, work in a very sustainable manner. That means if I just look at a production plant, in order to produce less scrap, in order to produce, uh, you use the materials efficiently, it be very inefficient in the times between different steps. You need to control each step. And that means you need smart sensors, smart meters, which are connected, which have to be very fast, which have access to databases to compare things and take the right decision. And prior, it's too late. And uh, I mean, any percentage of waste you produce is a disaster. And on the other hand, it's not just from a financial point of view a disaster, it's also a thing about ecologically. Uh, you have to avoid to, to make scrap nowadays. You have to think green. And, but I totally agree with what uh, Karak is saying. Um, this 5G gives you a high potential uh, to be much more efficient. Of course, you must make uh, 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 the business case, the balance, what does it mean in terms of investment and all the things. But I think it's the right way. If you know exactly the data, if you can control at any moment in time and make the right synthesis very fast, so we have about latency times, Get the, get the response from the, from the data center, you put the data. I think that is mandatory in order to be efficient from our perspective. So, um, and then and, and, uh, uh, can you give me go further going in industry 4.0? I mean, it's, it's not just about being efficient in terms of production, it's also being efficient in terms of people, making life easier. So we are running actually product, uh, uh, 
projects where we try how can we work together humans and robots. We have one uh, small pilot project, and there you need the data and information and all the things. So that there's many, many more things. But I think the most important point is, uh, for me, 5G uh, might not be the golden jug, but it gives a really new opportunities and to think innovative if you design new processes, if you are going to build up a new, a new plant, if you want to, to work remotely, I mean, we, we can go ahead uh, step by step. It's, uh, I mean, and of course, we don't have, like David said before, we don't have so much space. We are small, of course, but uh, the point is you need a lot of sensors in future to be as efficient as possible. And I think here is where 5G comes in the boat for us mm -hmm. and gets more of interest for us. David, question that I have for you also. Um, when I look back, or when I see in bigger companies, just nothing else but upgrading to a new operating system on the computers from Windows, I don't know what, to Windows, what, it's partly a monumental task. Now, equipping an organization or a company like, like a, the airport completely shifting to 5G, what time frames are we speaking here? What are the, the, the challenges that you face just to make this step also? Is it difficult? Is it rather easy? <laughs> <laughs> is it rather easy? No, different question. I mean, uh, it, it is, sometimes it's a daunting task, that's for sure, because um, for, for us, everything is new, right? Uh, for many of us, this is new. Uh, nevertheless, I think it, it's very important to, to accept and embrace right from the beginning that failure is an option, mm. always, because that takes away the fear of it, right? You, you should not be a, you know, uh, a hazardous adventurer, but nevertheless, you have to, you have to tackle the, the things step by step, and that's what we are doing, and in that sense, we are quite it's quite progressive what we are doing because f from the first starting point where we said, okay, this is, a, this is really a strategic invest for us, up to now only, yeah, I would say nine and a half months passed, but we already measured our first antennas outside and inside. And I think within the next, all software architecture is done, implementation is done. And within the next two and a half to three months, we, we are ready to go productive. So that is quite... Um, a trajectory, I would say, right? Um, it is, it does not say that we will be productive because probably around the corner, the next big thing is lurking in, in, in terms of this will not go on, right? But we have to tackle it and, uh, you know, divide and conquer. Pick it up <laughs> step by step. <laughs> Makes sense. Alain, you want to contribute to this question? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, I fully agree with you that failure is an option. And I think the success of those things always depends how you communicate to people. Because uh, in our case, or I know in your case, you have an infrastructure, you have certain people, you have competencies, you have your IT systems. And now come to people and you just say, hey guys, get 5G and everything is nice. You're already lost. And I think that is a very important point. Uh, because people are at the, mo at the beginning reluctant. They ask the question, will I be needed in the future? I worked with standard IT system, Wi-Fi. I had, I had standard Ethernet. Now we come with this as a competency we need it. So and I think that's very important. We should be carefully with all these things, take the opportunities and transfer it smoothly into the organization. And you need time and will it be efficient? We will see over time. Of course, I think you made your evaluations. You made the theoretical evaluation at a lot of consultancies, but I think get the buy-in at the people or people's level is half of the story already. Kiriakos. Maybe also your take on this, uh, implementation times, how to help also from your side as a provider. How can you jump in and make it easier for the companies to implement 5G on their sites for their processes? Yes, I think uh, as, as everything new, is uh, there is a learning process. Uh, we, we have now uh, struck uh, many, many deals on uh, 5G private networks uh, with uh, big customers. Um, I can I can I can mention the, uh, the the partnership with Ford in the UK um, as as a way to improve the, the production process there for electric vehicles and um, of course the the, the, the the fundamental thing is replacing the old uh, Wi-Fi networks and speed up production but um, we need to learn as well how important is 
um, to, to understand from our side operator about the production processes. I mean, and for a single, say, EV uh, product, uh, it could generate more than half a million pieces of data every minute. Yeah, This is completely different mindset from consumer business, which we have been knowing for, for, for the last 20 years. And um, with the 5G, there needs to be very, very reliable, um, have no interference, uh, be very, very secure, because this is what will provide at the end more accurate manufacturing control and analysis. Yes, because and every every shop floor um, it requires significant time and investment. Um, but when when now comes a new generation, has to present the opportunity to uh, transform the speed of the launch and flexibility of uh, bringing up new new facilities and. Uh, enabling new, new plants as well. Thank you very much, Kyriakos. Uh, I just wanted to come back to uh, what you said, Alain, at the beginning. You welcomed the students which are here today, and I suppose that there are also quite a lot of young people connected virtually uh, with us. Let's speak a little bit about career opportunities or how young people today can orient their career in the future. Where do you think, or what do you think young people of their age should look for when it comes to their education and what kind of skills shall they develop under the light of Industry 4.0 connectivity? So, first of all, uh, as a basic information from my side, maybe some parents don't like what I say, but it's, <laughs> I was a lot organizing students' organization before. So everybody should do what he likes. So nobody should run in the direction because it's now a hype. So, I mean, but in terms of uh, what you just addressed here, I mean, it's very clear. I mean, if somebody likes it, if somebody has a mindset, there are great opportunities. In the companies, I mean, uh, today, where are we struggling most? We are struggling in the IT sector. The problem is really ITC. Get all the competencies you need in place. Even globally, it's difficult to get the people. And uh, if I look now at these 5G discussions and, and everything which is coming, more and more data, data analysts, data treatment, to instance, synthesis out of this. We need a quite broad band of uh, competencies that can be mathematicians, that can be data scientists, I said it, that can be uh, computer scientists, that can be uh, physicists, uh, electrotechnical people. So, I mean, it, it, it's quite broad. But the very important point is, um, if you decide for, for, for an education to, to make studies, you, you have to, to follow your heart, your things, your passion not just go to something, yes, I need a job and I want to make big money. If you have the right mindset, you will have a lot of fun and you will also make career and, 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 and you will make money. So, And uh, that's also something what people want to have. And of course, there's another question, work-life balance. And work-life balance is not feasible if you don't have a job you like. That is for me very important. And I tell this very provocative now because very often you have interviews with people which explain your work-life balance. And then you ask, what is the job in here? <laughs> And uh, that, that's something that's important. But just if you feel that's the right thing for you, there are big opportunities in industry. And I would be very happy if one day I get your CV on my table and say, hey, that is great. I think these were very, very nice closing remarks. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Need to move over to the next one. Thank you very much, Kiriakos. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank, Thank you, you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's move over from Industry 4.0 to something else which is less tangible, but probably all have heard of blockchain, right? Who has heard of blockchain here in the room? Okay, there are quite a lot, quite a lot. I would say it's, it's a small majority of the people. Now blockchain, most of the people who have thought about blockchain, they thought about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, etc. But blockchain is so much more. And the interesting link that we're going to discuss now with Dorota Zimok, straight from Poland. She came to Luxembourg. She told me before, no, 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 I want to come to Luxembourg. I want to be here in person just simply because of the networking opportunities. Great to have you with us, uh, Dorota. You're going to speak about yeah. blockchain and especially also the connection to 5G. Please enjoy. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoy this morning as, uh, as much as I do. And I'm very happy to be here and share some thoughts and some experience around 
5G and the blockchain coming together. I'm also very happy to bring a little bit of diversity here, and I'm blinking to all the ladies in the room as well. You know, I'm, I'm very glad you are also entering the technology unit and topic. Uh, right, so. I would like to move on with my presentation, but it's not responding. It's not. It's technology. <laughs> oh. Should work. This one, right? okay. No, this one. This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, my name is Dorota Zimno, and I bring the experience from the tours, from financial services as well as from transportation. And so my examples I will use today will touch upon those two topics. So we are talking here about connected world. We heard a lot already yesterday and today. And when we talk about connected world, we are talking about the world that would be safe and the world that would be resilient, the world that would be resourceful, sustainable, efficient, and effective. I like to talk about this world as a smart world, world in which we will have connected devices, autonomous driving, smart factories, telemedicine and conducting the surgeries from all around the world, etc., etc. What you see here are two examples of what already the connected world means. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the autonomous vehicle that is already up and running and deployed to do the job in a port in Gothenburg. On the right-hand side, you see some construction equipment that is already working in a minefield in a, in a mine in, in China. Both of those solutions are, at the moment, in a very controlled environment, very specific environment. This is because it requires to control the data and re it requires to control the response of such devices. So when we talk about smart world, the world is enabled by emerging technologies, but it's powered by data. And the challenge we have today with the data is the data is very fragmented. The data is fragmented because uh, some of the technologies do not allow or allowed so far yet for fast uh, processing of such data and collecting of such data. But it is also because the parties in the process don't really trust each other enough to share the one single repository of data. And this is where technologies come to help. 5G technology, as we've heard already, so I will not gonna to repeat myself and talk about you know, what it offers, but we know it's low latency, it allows for real-time decision, uh, decision making, it allows for much bigger capacity and much faster response time when it comes to, um, to using the data. So we talk about speed, responsiveness, and connectivity. While blockchain, on the other hand, brings additional benefits. Now, for those, some of you raise your hand talking, uh, saying that you've already heard about blockchain. But just in short, for those who may not yet grasp the whole idea. Indeed, the blockchain initially was launched by Satoshi Nakamoto as a part of the, of the protocol to help with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And that's how a lot of people think about blockchain, cryptocurrencies. But the blockchain, it's really the technology that allows for recording any transactions and when I say transaction, it's not only fi financial transaction, it's really an event, for example, of transferring the ownership of something or transferring asset, transferring value that is happening between the parties. And now such a transaction is being captured, is being agreed by consensus, so everybody who is participating in that, in that network, in that blockchain, is agreeing and uh, collectively saying, yes, this is the valid transaction, it is the, then timestamped and then added to the chain of, uh, in the block, therefore, or chain of blocks. Therefore, any event, if it was to change, if it was to be updated, it will be added as another event in the chain. It's not replacing the existing one, so in that sense, no information is disappearing, no information is manipulated, it's basically event that is captured. And this is very important because what it allows us to do, and I think for us to understand where blockchain can add value, is to understand at the minimum those three key characteristics. Immutability. This is exactly what I've just explained. You cannot 
temper the set of transactions that are already recorded. You can add, but any manipulation will be just seen as another event. So you can quickly, auditably check the whole record. The second uh, very important characteristics of blockchain is decentralization. What it means? It means the blockchain allows not for one central unit to control the whole environment. It's decentralized among all the participants in the, in the network. Therefore, uh, all the participants have access to the so-called single version of truth. At any single point in time, looking in the blockchain, you can all see the same transaction. So for example, if I was to take today insurance and I get the offer, I'm looking exactly at the same offer that the insurer looks at and that the other parties that are involved look at. It's not like they have one version, they have another. It's very important because this is where the trust is being brought to the network, which wasn't there before. And this trust allows us to really step ahead with a lot of different solutions. And what I would like to address right now is to show you the four examples where 5G and blockchain come together and how they uh, uh, enable creating value. So the first one I would like to talk about, it's really one of the first cases of using blockchain in general, and it's track and trace. It was initially used uh, by, uh, to, to track the uh, uh, um, diamonds, but today uh, this, this trend is, is used in, uh, in a lot of industries, including automotive. So here is the example. You will find out the company from looking at the pictures, uh, where this company decided to track and trace cobalt. Cobalt is a very rare mineral, very important one for automotive industry because it's used in batteries. At the same time, sourcing it ethically and sourcing this sustainably is extremely important. We're talking today a lot about sustainability. That's the solution that blockchain, recording the events one by one, can allow to control this sustainability. At the same time, 5G, thanks to the processing of data, allows to see at any single point in time, to process the data and show where the particular cobalt in this, in this uh, situation is. And in that sense, we can very quickly track the, uh, the minerals and the and, uh, you know, the similar solution is applied, for example, IBM and Walmart did the same for food processing, where you can imagine how important it is to know where and how the, the food is being, for example, transported. So it's one of the examples. The other example I wanted to talk is also from transportation world, and that's, that's the platooning trend. Platooning is basically the trend in which you have one car, which is a leading car, leading vehicle, say truck, and then there are other so-called trailing trucks or vehicles that are in convoy and they are basically led by that first car. Now, what, what's so exciting about putting 5G and blockchain together in this context? First of all, 5G allows for very quick processing of information. So we've just discussed this yesterday in a workshop and to put it simply, today if you would have a platooning solution based on the current technology. It uses sensors, it uses a leader, etc. system. And what it means is if the leading car stops or breaks, then the next car by sensor, since the situation starts breaking, then passes this information to the next one that starts breaking. You can see that there's some latency here. While in the 5G, deploying 5G means that the leading car can send vehicle to vehicle communication and all the cars in the long convoy get this information at the very same point in time, so they can take the action not one by one, but all at the same time. And this is very important because obviously that improves the response rate, that improves safety, that improves the, and optimizes the whole solution. Now where comes the blockchain in that, you may, you may ask. Well, think about adding now the blockchain for recording all the events, like how much, uh, what was the mileage, who was the leading track, etc. And then automatically, by using something called smart contracts, which is part of the blockchain, smart contracts is such a solution which works on if-then scenarios. So basically, if, you, if some uh, events happened or some criteria were met, therefore some actions are taken. So if we all agree in platooning solution that if the leading car is leading, is going to be paid for the petrol that it used by other trailing vehicles, then all the data is being automatically collected after this you know, road is being, or route is being completed, and the leading car automatically is paid from the wallets of the trailing cars without involvement of people 
all in a real time, basically. So you can see where the blockchain, because of, you know, everybody has the same single version of truth, can leverage from, from each other's information and uh, streamline whole process. Another solution I would like to show you is data privacy. Why is so important? Because really for uh, 5G and blockchain and everything take off together and uh, IoT to that matter as well, as, as it's usually talking about being triage of those three emerging technologies, is that this privacy and security of data is very important. Imagine the situation you are today uh, checking to the hotel, as I did yesterday, and you are asked to provide the ID. I provide my passport. My passport has all the information there about my date of birth, my, 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 um, it may have some other information about my uh, address, if this is some other ID, etc. But maybe not all, and likely not all the information are needed by the hotel at that particular point in time. But they have no choice but to chose, show all. On the internet, it's even more uh, challenging because if I need to fill the form, I fill the, all the information for this particular website, but if I clicked on accept cookies, this information with my date of birth, my name and everything can fly all around the, you know, the network now, right? So I have little control, if, if any control, over my data there. Now, the solution that is being developed for a couple of years now, and it's really picking the momentum right now, it's called self-sovereign identity. SSI in short. And what it allows basically, it decentralizes every piece of information of, of your identity. And when I say your, it's individuals. But the same applies to machines, the same applies to organizations as well. And you can decide, based on the solution, which piece of information you are revealing to which party. So if only date of birth is, is important, because if you try to buy alcohol and you're lucky enough to look like you're 21 or 25, you need to show your ID, hello, I don't need to show all my information, not even my name, because it's only the date of birth that is needed there, right? In this situation, you can use their sovereign uh, identity. And the very last example I wanted to show is data monetization. So we already can fragment the data and share it, but why don't we earn on the data as it is today that other companies are earning on our data without our permission? Here is one of the most fascinating examples I could find recently, which is Jaguar uh, uh, Land Rover uh, implemented the solution of a smart wallet for the, for the car. Basically what happens is when you drive this, smart, uh, this car, it records all the conditions of the road, conditions of the weather, traffic jams, etc. And all this information is then processed and trans, uh, transferred to the, the uh, repository. You are earning cryptocurrencies or tokens for the driving, for your data, and that can be then used by the car to pay for tolls, for petrol, you name it. So basically what is happening already today is just being monetized. And I think it's a very democratic way of, you know, of uh, taking value from what already own, you own and belongs to you. So in this context, you can also explain and imagine where the blockchain and 5G comes together. 5G for very quick response and data collection, and the blockchain for recording that, making sure that it's all immutable, it's all there for, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, completing the transaction, if you like. But my last words on all this is that nothing of this emerging technology will bring value without really looking at the business side of it. What's the most important is that no technology should be impl implemented just for technology's sake. It's all to solve the business problems. To solve the business problems, you require to have talent in the organization that comes from very different levels. So it's not only IT should know about emerging technologies, it's marketing, it's legal, etc. They all should come together because that's where they will create value. You cannot do it just in your organization. You need to involve in ecosystems and open innovation. And that's very important to involve other parties. And last but not least, what's very important is that we are all here in the room and all online and all around responsible for implementing emerging technologies responsibly. We have one planet, and it's all, everybody's matter to protect it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorota. I, when you were talking about the uh, data that we share with the people, uh, I asked myself, wouldn't it be also an idea 
when we come in here, we have to do our COVID check. We have to scan our barcode, our QR code, and we have to kind of transmit our data. Wouldn't it be for the future also an idea to use blockchain and 5G technology if this COVID check will last for a longer time, just simply to make sure that only kind of the OK is uh, transmitted and not all my personal data? Yes, so in, in the UK, I can already name at least two companies that provide such a solution and it's being rolled out, so we will soon see that. One is IBM that, uh, that did that, and the other is Belong company that originated from Poland, also based in the UK. So these solutions are already existing. It's, it's a matter of, uh, I would say, more commercialization and implementation of such solutions, but you are absolutely right. These are exactly the thoughts that we should have when we think about applying this technology. Dorota, many thanks for making blockchain not anymore an abstract construct that nobody knows what it can be used for. 5G and blockchain, I think in the future we're going to see it very often. And as with so many other things with 5G, we're not going to see it. We're just going to have it and we're not even going to realize anymore that we have it around us. It's just going to be there making our life maybe more safe, maybe greener and maybe also more convenient. Thank you very much, Dorota. Big Amen. applause for you. <laughs> Thank you. This brings me also to the end of this first session from the morning now. I think you were probably waiting for it. No, probably you were not waiting for it because it was so interesting what we heard. So you were not waiting for it. But still, you deserve it. Your coffee break, your virtual coffee break. Get a cup of coffee. Stay in front of the computer. We're going to be back very soon for the next part of the conference. Thank you very much.